All right, well, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our regular Thursday lunch. I'm going to turn uh, this over to Professor Tone, who's uh, going to moderate for today. Uh, so we're fortunate to have him to, uh, to join us, so you don't have to listen to me. Uh, but I guess uh, I'll stand up so you can see me. <laughs> okay. um, so hi, everyone. Uh, Robert Tones. I'm an adjunct here. I teach uh, in the Security Studies Program Master's course, the uh, core course in, in higher theory. Uh, but when I uh, saw that uh, uh, Dr. Seller was going to be here, I jumped at the chance to moderate because I actually had him as a student, uh, I want to say 20 years ago, but a, a while ago, um, uh, when I was uh, a visiting fellow um, in Israel at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So I uh, wanted to see him and uh, learn from him again. And so I think this is going to be um, a very exciting, uh, hopefully discussion-filled uh, event. I shouldn't have to moderate much given the topic. and so. Um, uh, I know that you will uh, all ask questions and be prepared to uh, engage. A little bit of background, um, as you probably know, since he's here, um, Avraham is uh, here as um, the Aaron and Cecile Goldman Visiting Israeli Professor in the Department of Government. Um, he has recently retired after a long career uh, leading the Department of International Relations at Hebrew University and the Leonard David Institute for International Relations, um, which is where I met him. Uh, the, um, of his uh, publications, uh, I've read and, and liked the second edition of the Palestinian Hamas, uh, which I read when it came out when I was in grad school, um, Vision, uh, Violence, and Adjustment. Um, and so Dr. Sell is going to open up with some brief remarks, and then he will open it up to discussion. Um, so uh, continue eating, uh, and then when we get to the moderation uh, part of it, um, we'll go around the room and uh, uh, get the discussion going. So um, just feel free to jump in and raise your hand at that time. Dr. Sell. Thank you very much, Robert, for this introduction, and welcome for this uh, talk. Uh, I appreciate your willingness at this time of almost exam and so on to, uh, to attend. Um, let me just uh, say that um, this project has began many years ago when I was doing my dissertation and came across the uh, phenomenon of uh, Arab volunteers who came from different Arab countries uh, in order to participate in the war of 1948 between Arabs and Jews in Palestine. And um, um, I had the, uh, of course, the uh, advantage of uh, looking into archives, not <coughs> Arab archives, but uh, British archives, Israeli archives, and um, a lot of documents that were uh, taken by the Israeli forces during the war which told uh, almost the whole story about those volunteers who came from different Arab countries under different banners, uh, Arab nationalism, Isla Islamism, um, and, and, and so on. So this gave me, gave me a very uh, um, solid basis to begin with this, uh, with this uh, uh, project. But it, it remained sort of uh, um, um, marginal in my um, endless uh, juggling between duties and, and other interests of, of research until I came to um, the, um, just by coincidence, uh, to look more into the case of Afghanistan, uh, namely the uh, uh, jihadist Afghan Arabs who went to Afghanistan to fight or to help the Afghan uh, population um, during the uh, mostly 80s and early, early 90s. Um, and I tried to understand the uh, uh, origins and the roots, um, not only because an offshoot of that phenomenon turned to be Al-Qaeda and um, everything that happened um, on 9-11, <clears throat> but uh, I, I really tried to go f back and understand based on my experience with the case of 1948, um, where states were um, not only instrumental, they actually uh, played a primary role in supervising and uh, um, uh, accounting for uh, those volunteers who, who, who were recruited or came by their own uh, uh, will. Uh, I, I wanted to see to what extent in this case of, of the uh, uh, Afghan Arabs, states were also involved. And um, what I found uh, actually made me think that there is a very good case here for comparison between these two, these two cases. Because 
yes, I had much less uh, access to uh, documents or to decision uh, uh, making by governments, but I could uh, uh, accumulate still uh, quite a substantial uh, data uh, from various uh, uh, sources, from newspapers, from uh, uh, memoirs, and uh, from other uh, 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 sources, semi-documentary, uh, um, that were good enough for me to uh, um, think and understand that it's, it's about time to conceptualize this phenomenon and try to understand uh, not only what these uh, uh, people who um, uh, came out of being volunteers in wars beyond their national territory, uh, but also, I mean, what they were doing uh, in the case of terrorism or so, but also really to understand the relationships between them and their uh, countries of origin. And, and it was especially striking because I thought, why should the states be at all willing to support these transnational uh, uh, um, competence? Because there is a, a, a logical uh, uh, contradiction between the, what is called the raison d'etat and the uh, Weberian perception that the state, of course, is the uh, uh, exclusive actor holding the uh, legitimate uh, right to use to use violence within its territorial jurisdiction, and here states are willing to let go or even support people who uh, are their citizens, and they were going to fight somewhere beyond uh, the horizon sometimes, um, and in most of the cases, just in as in 1948, um, in Afghanistan, in the case of Afghanistan, most of the volunteers came from opposition groups. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, it was primarily uh, uh, Islamists, but in the case of 1948, actually they were mixed. Nationalists, ultra-nationalists, uh, uh, um, and, and, and Islamists. So, trying to look at the literature uh, that, that uh, has anything to do with the phenomenon of, uh, of uh, uh, volunteers. Actually, you'll find only two books published so far. Uh, one by David Mallet, speaking about foreign fighters, um, and the other one um, by Neil Ariely and uh, another one that I forgot right now, which happens in my age sometimes, um, <laughs> quite, quite a lot. Um, and, and, but bo both of them are primarily interested in processes of recruitment, of mobilization, um, of propagating the message by which uh, potential volunteers would be persuaded to leave everything and go. Um, David Mallet gives very little uh, attention to the role of governments and even in, in this context, it is primarily um, through the uh, aspect of restricting the movement of individuals and groups uh, to um, battlegrounds beyond the uh, 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 territorial, territorial uh, uh, boundaries of those states. Namely, it was primarily during the uh, Spanish Civil War that Canada, France, Britain, um, the United States, of course, um, legislated some of those restrictions in order to prevent the movement of volunteers to, to Spain. But actually, it was never implemented. I mean, the, uh, the law was never taken beyond just publishing it. Uh, in neither case of, of the Spanish Civil War or the 1948 war, um, where many volunteers from Canada, United States, and Britain came to fight in Palestine on the side of the Jews. And here we have actually more than one case of 1948. It was Jews fighting on the, on the, on the side of, of the uh, Jewish community and, and later Israel, 
and Arab volunteers who came to fight uh, for the sake of, uh, of the Palestinian Arabs. Um, so unlike much or most of the literature that has been published since the early 2000s, and which was primarily interested in l tracing the uh, 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 line back to uh, where the 9-11 uh, attacks began, namely speaking mostly about Al-Qaeda and on, what I'm trying to do is to see how and why volunteers from Arab countries or from non-Arab Muslim countries uh, made this, uh, this move, and especially because of the large numbers. And I think it's redundant to say here how much um, during the last 20 years or 30 years we've uh, uh, been witnessing a growing uh, scope of this phenomenon of uh, par particularly jihadism. But, um, you know, I remember an old uh, article, I think it was published in 1991, um, when um, um, Stephen David uh, warned that uh, the future threats would not come from uh, necessarily strong military powers, but on the contrary, that weak states, failing states, at that time the term did not exist yet, but he spoke mainly about the problem of weak states that might become a hub of violence, of uh, 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 um, illegal trafficking of weapons and drugs and, and, and so on and so forth. And generally speaking, he, he actually per uh, uh, perceived the, these states as a future danger uh, for international security. And indeed, if you look at what happened in Lebanon during the, the uh, civil war that went on for about 15 years on and off, um, Somalia um, and a number of other uh, uh, states in which the central government either became weak or um, did not function well, that these areas became um, an attractive arena for all kinds of opposition groups and primarily transnational uh, uh, networks um, because it was there where they could flourish, they could they could uh, uh, operate without the pressure of their of, of their own government governments. So I'm trying to understand this phenomenon of, and I'm I'm using a lot the word volunteering rather than foreign fighters because I think foreign fighters minimizes the uh, um, individual motivation to do something for the collective. Uh, what uh, uh, Deepak Gupta called uh, collective altruism. In other words, people have the sense of being a member of, or members within a bigger community, and um, this uh, belonging, identity, sometimes very clear ideology, may lead under certain circumstances to the sense that David Mallet uh, defined very nicely as um, 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 defensive mobilization, um, that they would leave everything and simply go because the call uh, is, is very persuasive to indeed materialize the sense of belonging to that, to, that, to that group. And in many cases, one can see how and, and, and the uh, extent to which ideology played a very important role. So let me, let me uh, within, this, uh, within this context, uh, say a few words about how the concept or paradigm of state-society relations um, helps us better understanding the role of states in playing an active role or 
at least a passive slash active role in allowing or supporting such a movement of, and we are talking about major projects. I mean, uh, uh, Spain, uh, or in the case of the Spanish Civil War, the numbers were anywhere between 40,000 and 50,000 uh, within less than a year and a half, even though the Civil War went on for three years, or almost three years. In the case of uh, 1948, we are talking about some five to 7,000 uh, volunteers for each side. Jews and Arabs. In the case of Afghanistan, the numbers are uh, extremely uh, inflated, um, but one can speak realistically about anywhere between 10 to 15,000. There were more than 2,300 casualties, so one can imagine that the numbers uh, are not 30, 40, 50,000, as uh, Olivier Roy uh, uh, mentions, but rather uh, much, much, much lower. Uh, even though there might be um, a much larger number of people who went to Pakistan, uh, came back home um, with the uh, uh, title of Afghan Arabs, but they never fought or never really took uh, 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 any share or any, any part in, 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 in combat uh, uh, operations. Um, so how the um, state-society relations uh, uh, approach can help us. Well, especially, I mean, you know, I have to say this. Whenever I speak to an American, American audience, I have to, I have to repeat it. Um, in the Western world, or Western scholarship, usually takes the state as a given, as a self-evident unit, the basic unit in international relations, and there are very few questions about what is the state, or what, what does it include, or how, what is it made of. The literature about, or the comparative uh, politics literature, tries to look into differences between more modern, developed states and developing states, and found uh, uh, endless of, of, uh, of differences, primarily in terms of the quality of relationship between the state and society. In the developing, I mean, I'm trying to make it very short because people get very quickly tired of uh, uh, listening to theory. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, state is, the state is actually, is actually not the omnipotent agent responsible for or capable of um, inculcating uh, ideas, consensus, um, and, and, and unifying the population or the, the society around the uh, policies that the government decides. Um, they don't have the capability of uh, what uh, uh, Joel Migdal calls penetrating society. In the uh, developing countries, the state, in fact, is only one of the social forces. This is why Joel Migdal, uh, Migdal's later uh, work is entitled State in Society. In other words, the state is another actor fighting or, or, or uh, 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 competing for status, legitimacy, uh, acceptance, mobilization, um, and hence, the state conducts um, different strategies with different social forces according to needs and according to circumstances. So you may find the state sometimes being in contradiction or uh, uh, hostility with a specific political or uh, 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 social movement, and at other times they coalesce and cooperate with each other. Within this context, um, Probably the most significant value or the most significant sort of uh, 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 commodity is symbolic. Namely, um, things that are connected to the popular culture, uh, which in most of the Middle Eastern countries, of course, is Arab Islamic. And so um, the state actually competes uh, uh, regularly 
uh, with other groups over control of society by using these values and these, these symbols uh, because other groups use, it, use them too. So the state is, is in a constant process of, 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 of competition. Um, and without going any further into, into this, uh, this uh, uh, theory, I'll, I'll just say that um, unlike the uh, concept of strong, weak states, uh, these uh, uh, binary uh, divisions, actually the state should be seen as just one of the actors. And in this context of sending or helping volunteers to go and fight or help other uh, uh, societies, Muslim or Arab, um, the state was actually competing with those opposition groups um, for leading rather than being dragged behind in order to maintain their prestige, in order to maintain or to attain uh, uh, more prestige. And, and this is the context within which I, I see the willingness and actually the eagerness of uh, governments uh, both in 1948, and I'm talking only uh, about the Arab Muslim uh, aspect in 1948, because um, the Jewish or the non-Jewish volunteers who came to help the uh, Jewish state um, came from different countries, mostly developed ones, so they, they don't belong to, to, that, to that framework. Uh, but definitely in the case of Afghanistan, one can see how states cooperated not only in helping people leave and go to, to Afghanistan or to Pakistan, from there to Afghanistan, but they also shared directly or through semi-official agencies. For example, take the uh, um, Saudi um, uh, Islamic, Islamic uh, uh, Association, uh, Islamic World Association, or the uh, Red Crescent Association, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and others. So the states were funneling uh, funds through those um, semi-official agencies, and sometimes they were financing them directly. Um, and, and here we come to this contradiction between the need of the state to show some compliance with international law on the one hand, and on the other, the need to serve domestic issues due to the sense of uh, uh, insecurity or lack of, lack of stability at home. So, so, of course, states were not eager to demonstrate their role in sending these, these volunteers. But, you know, I, I can only say in, in kind of brackets that it's, a, it's an illusion to think that ISIS could grow to the uh, 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 scope and, and dimensions that it did without the support of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, this way or another, to this group or another. Because even if Saudi Arabia officially said it a number of times from 2012 at least on, that they had a policy of preventing people from going to fight in Syria, we have to think about the state as much more than the central government, if there is a central government. For example, uh, Prince Banda had a very different policy from the king, and this is why he was dismissed and replaced. Um, so sometimes you have very rich uh, uh, people who privately and individually support certain groups of volunteers, um, while others uh, follow the uh, official line. So again, the state should be taken with a grain of salt. It's not one agency. It's many, actually, many voices, many, many uh, uh, interests. And the ideas of jihad, the ideas of doing something for the whole community of Muslims, I don't have to tell you, they are deeply rooted in these societies, and uh, they, they are supposed to reward those who uh, stand by them or implement them. 
So this is why many people who went to Afghanistan or to Pakistan, according to Turwa, spent a few days, came back home as Afghan Arabs. They were celebrated by their uh, uh, communities uh, of the neighborhood or the village or whatever uh, 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 their acquaintance uh, uh, came from. So um, imagine in the, in the course of the early 80s when television and, and here the media played a very important role, brought pictures of what happened to the Afghan people um, as a result of the uh, uh, war between the Mujahideen and um, the uh, central government, the communist government, and of course the Soviet invaders. Um, many people tell in their memoirs that they had nothing to do with Afghanistan. They never heard about, about what was going on there, but they saw pictures and this made them uh, feel that this was their duty. Many people who had been very distant from religiosity um, actually saw it as their role or their uh, duty um, to go and do something. And by this, it strengthened their uh, sense of belonging. Uh, and I don't have to tell you, many young people in these countries suffer from unemployment, uh, very low prestige, socially speaking. Um, they have um, a system of, of, of education that gives them free education, but very few opportunities to uh, get employment. So we have to put a lot of uh, uh, components within this picture in order to understand why certain people even those who admit that they had very little to do with religiosity or with uh, Islamic duties, um, I mean, daily uh, uh, Islamic, Islamic duties, um, found it as, uh, if not attractive, at least uh, um, an obligation to, to go and do something for, for the, for the uh, Afghan, Afghan uh, 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 people. Now, um, in the case of the, uh, of the Arab League, namely the regional institution that uh, um, encompassed in 1948 seven Arab states, um, they, they were confronted by a problem. Uh, Britain was about to leave Palestine. Uh, the UN had just decided uh, uh, to partition Palestine into a Jewish and Arab state. The Palestinians were absolutely against such partition and were willing to fight. And it well, was well known that they were unprepared and the weaker side of the two. So the need to help them um, was kind of a, 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 a default uh, a, 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 a solution because they could not interfere directly, and they did not want to interfere directly because of their weak armies, because of mistrust of uh, the armies by the uh, ruling elites. And they decided to take a middle way of organizing a volunteer force. And here we are talking about those five to 7,000 people who came within a period of a few months from late 1947 to uh, uh, more or less uh, mid-1948, um, and were under various commands, mostly under the Arab League um, military committee, but also under different commands of uh, Egyptians and, and, uh, uh, and others. Um, and I'm not going here at this, uh, this uh, presentation into the question of what was the uh, efficiency or impact of this participation of volunteers, which is a subject for another, another uh, study. Uh, namely, the question is um, a question of organization, institutionalization, and, uh, and leadership, uh, in addition to, of course, resources and, and others. Um, but what I can say here is that um, the uh, um, states were ostensibly disconnected from this uh, 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 effort or this project, and it was the Arab League as a regional organization and a non-state uh, agent 
uh, that took responsibility for, for, the, for, for the volunteers, although the uh, ammunition and weapons and, and uh, the, the logistics, of course, came from, from the Arab states, who were given quotas to uh, uh, provide to the, to the volunteer, volunteers during, during the war. Um, and I hope you're not going to ask me what is the difference between um, uh, foreign fighters or volunteers to uh, jihadist wars and uh, mercenaries, because it's very clear. Um, most uh, of the literature speaks about foreign fighters as those who are not expecting any material reward, and they are doing it out of uh, ideological or uh, some other uh, uh, motivations. Uh, but in 1948, actually, many of the volunteers came well organized in semi-regular formations, uh, battalions, uh, companies. Um, later on, they got organized uh, as regiments, somewhere between battalion and, 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 uh, uh, and brigade. Uh, and they were, they were paid. They were paid. And they were made of very interesting combination. There were ultra-nationalist groups, there were ethnic groups, Alawites, Druze, um, Circassians. Um, and here again, you can see the difference between, or the, not the difference, the, 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 the gap between the state and those communities. Because they were minorities um, with uh, the need to actually challenge the state. They were not willing to accept the state, which had just been born as, a, as an independent one. Syria, Lebanon became independent in 1946. Iraq was under British occupation until 1946. Uh, Egypt was still uh, uh, under British, um, if not occupation, at least military presence in the Canal Zone until 1956. So um, there was a lot of... Um, um, give and take between the government and those uh, minority groups or ethnic groups. Um, and here comes the, the main conclusion. The state was simply happy to get rid of these groups, whether they came from the Muslim Brotherhood or from the Alawite uh, um, um, or, the, or the Druze uh, uh, um, minority. Um, and at least relieve itself from their pressure for a while. Because what happened was that when the war came to an end and they went back home, many of them were arrested. And we see the same phenomenon with those who came back after Afghanistan. The state actually helped them go, but continued to follow them by intelligence and all kinds of other uh, uh, means. And many of them, who came back home by 92, 93, uh, found themselves uh, uh, heavily under pressure of the security organizations, interrogated, many of them were put to trial. There were uh, a number of uh, death sentences in Egypt, for example. Um, and as we know, many of them decided not to go home, not to go back home, but rather to continue, sorry, and. <coughs> Uh, take part in other uh, uh, civil wars, such as in Yugoslavia, or former Yugoslavia, in Chechnya, in Kashmir, and, and, and so on. And those who came back home actually triggered uh, or became a core element in rebuilding uh, networks of uh, uh, violence. Um, and I'm, I'm not calling them terrorists, by the way because uh, I think this is a key issue in understanding the phenomenon. If you call them terrorists, you miss the point. From their viewpoint, they are not terrorists. They are implementing a, a, a sacred duty. And once we understand that, we, we have a different perception. And I, I believe it will be easier to deal with the phenomenon. But that's something I, I say to, to people here in this country, and also in my country, because uh, people think that by, by calling them terrorists, um, it, it, it resolves something. It, it, it doesn't. Anyway, um, so 
ideology. The propagation of the message is extremely important. And here, we are talking about the 20th century. And even in the Middle East and Arab world, the media, already by 1948, uh, uh, was developed enough to send the message through the, the press uh, and through even uh, uh, radio uh, um, um, broadcasting. Um, but definitely, in the case of Afghanistan, um, I want to tell the story because this is very, very important. Until the late 70s, early 80s, the prevailing concept of jihad in most of the Muslim countries was domestic. Namely, it was targeting the apostate rulers and elites. It was very different from the original jihad concept of ancient Islam, which was, of course, targeting the non-Muslims, the infidels. And it was the uh, main principle dominating Islamic, if you want, international policy. In other words, this was the way to deal with the non-Muslim world, to bring the uh, infidels into the domain of Islam, if not as Muslims, at least people who live under Islamic law, namely the Sharia. In 1983, Abdullah Azam, who is, I'm, I'm sure, well known here, um, the, 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 the spiritual father of the uh, uh, project of uh, jihad in Afghanistan by Arabs, not the local Mujahidun, uh, published a fatwa, which is a learned um, religious um, uh, opinion in which he shifted the meaning of jihad back to its ancient uh, uh, understanding, namely by pointing to what was going on in Afghanistan. He said that um, the duty of Muslims was to fight a defensive jihad against the in invaders of, uh, of Islamic, Islamic territories. It was, it was quite ironic that as a Palestinian by origin, he had to prioritize um, Afghanistan over Palestine. Uh, and he explained why. It was simply, he said, because there was already a jihad war going there. And because topographically speaking, it was much more promising uh, than, than Palestine, which was uh, uh, dominated by a very powerful uh, uh, country, at least militarily, uh, which was a very realistic uh, consideration. And this fatwa, according to a number of um, testimonies, um, apparently uh, made a tremendous imp impression uh, on youngsters uh, in, the, in the Muslim world and uh, pushed many of them to uh, go and, 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 and do it. Um, of course, the, uh, the fatwa was not uh, the only reason why people were persuaded. Uh, it was also the media and Azam's uh, endless efforts to uh, lecture everywhere, to visit um, the, the uh, uh, um, pilgrims uh, during the, the Hajj time in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, he came even to the United States a number of times. He, he raised funds, and, and, and he was actually the, root, the true engine behind this, behind this project. But one thing was missed by the literature, and this is that the fatwa was signed by 11 Islamic scholars, the first of whom was the, the uh, 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 Supreme Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Abdul, uh, uh, Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Now, Yes, it, it is not exactly the state, but the mufti of Saudi Arabia, like any other Muslim country, is actually an employee of the government. And by supporting this fatwa, by the mufti of Saudi Arabia, of Yemen, of many other states, actually the state had some say in, 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 in this. And obviously, the fact that so many 
leading scholars of Islam signed the fatwa, the fatwa made it much more powerful and convincing than had it been only signed by, by Azam himself. Now, during all those years of the 80s, and, and uh, uh, especially 80s, until Azam was assassinated, um, he used to come and talk to high-level officials of Saudi Arabia, of the Islamic establishment, and so on and so forth, um, to the extent that it was clear uh, that, that he was perceived, if not as an agent of the Saudi government, it was at least something that they could easily identify with and, and hence support his, his efforts. And indeed, much of the funds that uh, were needed to continue the project of sending Arab volunteers to Afghanistan um, was funneled through Azam uh, and, and, and before that, through semi-official uh, associations, um, some of them had branches in Pakistan itself. Um, and um, Azam himself established a headquarter called the uh, uh, Office of Services uh, in Peshawar, which was the main headquarter and the main the center of this effort. Uh, uh, not only of the Arab Mujahideen, uh, the Arab Afghans, but also also the, the uh, Afghan Mujahideen. Um, so, out of this uh, this puzzle of why states would help these uh, these uh, volunteers, when I when I looked into it, I was I was expecting that just as ha it happened in 1948 when people came back home and were immediately arrested. Look at what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood when they came back from the battlefield. They were arrested and put in Hagstaff, which is one of the uh, uh, former British, British bases in uh, uh, Egypt, uh, west of, uh, of the Suez Canal. Um, many others were imprisoned in Syria, in, in Lebanon, in Iraq. Um, same thing happened with the, with the, with the case of, uh, of the Afghan, Afghan volunteers. Um, and I already mentioned, mentioned this. So, from coalescing with the, the opposition groups and helping them go, keeping an eye on them during the fight, the state actually reneged on its support or cooperation with these groups uh, and turned entirely against them once they, they, they tried to come back because then they really constituted a threat. They came with uh, um, more military experience, they were much more uh, uh, hardened as, as a group. And this is why um, the uh, uh, 1990s, for example, in Egypt, in Algeria, and Saudi Arabia, were rife with uh, 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 confrontations between the state and uh, um, radical Islamists. Many of them were returnees of, uh, of, that, of that effort. Uh, uh, during the uh, uh, 80s and, uh, and early early 90s, um, so I'll stop here. I I hope I ma made my my point clear, and uh, feel okay. free to ask questions and make comments. I'll be more than happy to answer. Right. Does anyone have a question that they came with? Go ahead. And I had a question, you've, you've talked about volunteering of uh, fighters, and I wanted to know if you've done or found much literature and research on how socioeconomic status in a given place plays into a decision to go and volunteer, whether the affluence level uh, of an individual or a group plays into it. <coughs> By logic, I would think that people who are in a fairly dire status or don't have much to live for, collectively speaking, in a given place, could be more inclined and be a member of something of a cause, which would give them a sense of purpose. But when they're living in a place where they're in fairly good conditions and have it there, they're, they could feel the altruistic reason and connection to the broader scope of their religion, but then again, it could be harder for them to leave that status. So I wanted to know how that played uh, in your 
we said that before. Thank you. Um, well, generally speaking, um, public opinion polls conducted during the last 20 years in a number of Middle Eastern countries have shown that uh, the poorer and less uh, well-to-do economically, um, people tend to be more religious. Or you, you, have, you have a correlation between religiosity and uh, poverty, or let's say, not necessarily poverty in the uh, uh, worst uh, sense, but uh, say lower middle class. People who hardly make a living. They can be educated, they can be urban, um, but they still struggle to, to make a living. And uh, from some biographies published primarily in the periodical that was published in Peshawar during the um, years between 1984 and 1993, um, which I collected, I can, I can say that um, many of them came from those marginal uh, social groups, uh, absolutely. Um, there is also a difference between the level of leadership. Um, people who went there, went to Pakistan to deal with education, and with social welfare for the families of the volunteers and those who uh, went to fight, which were by and large people who came from lower uh, classes. So this is, this is, th there is some correlation and more than some. It, it's, uh, now in the case of 1948, you can see that uh, people who were um, mid-ranking uh, officers uh, in their armies, in the, in the Iraqi or Syrian armies, um, came and took uh, uh, commanding positions. Um, but in most of the cases, the rank and file were people who, who uh, were, um, I don't know if we can call them even lower middle class. Um, they were um, small traders. They were um, tailors and, and shoemakers and, and I mean, people with menial uh, uh, professions rather than educated. I could only find two in all the names that I could uh, uh, collect from that year who came from uh, very prestigious families. And it might not mean anything because you can be of a prestigious family but pretty marginal in that, in that family. So it doesn't really mean anything. But I, I think that your, your point is very, is very uh, um, thoughtful. I'm, I'm exactly. uh, if that's the case, then how would you explain the uh, new body of research that says that there is no correlation between um, social status, poverty, and terrorism? And how would you explain the flow of foreign fighters to ISIS that largely come from the middle class? Well, I, I haven't dealt with, with ISIS at all. I, I, I don't have much access or, or know much about, about ISIS in that context, I mean. I, I can speak more with some sense of, uh, of uh, um, security about, about 1948 and, and, and about, about, but look, I, I, was, I was for almost six years the head of the uh, Palestinian desk in the Israeli intelligence. And I was trying, of course, among other things, to um, follow and look into the question of who goes for um, you know, combat missions rather than sitting in the headquarters of Beirut and uh, publishing all kinds of announcements and, and propaganda. And it was definitely a clear division between those who were more educated and um, for some reason or another had more prestige than those who uh, risked their life. And, 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 and I, I had a number of uh, uh, times spoken to uh, uh, people who uh, were captured by the Israeli forces and interrogated them and asked them, why did you come? Where did you uh, uh, grow up? Uh, uh, what's your social background? And my absolute uh, uh, conclusion is that um, they, they represented the uh, more marginal, the poorer, 
sometimes even broken families, and it's not a, 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 a rare phenomenon among people in the Middle East, especially uh, when we talk about refugees of a number or consecutive wars. Um, so, I, but I, so I'm not able to, 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 to respond to the question of... This is something I was going to ask on the follow-up, is I think, because um, you did mention it, that there's, I mean, to your point, there's a little bit of difference between um, people that are you know, looking at their social economic background and their mobilization recruitment specifically to engage in terrorist activities, become suicide bombers or hijackers or something, you know, which is a, a um, same maybe recruitment pool and same maybe mobilization process versus you know, a foreign fighter or someone, you know, that's going to, what they believe, join a, a group and engage in a state building or group building exercise where they become part of something that, that is, you know, different. And maybe that's the pool where the percentage that are going to be more radicalized and into, into terror. So I think that that's one of the things that I was kind of interested in getting into and recognizing that you haven't done research on ISIS, so is how some of these dynamics that you did mention in terms of the role of the state, the role of ideology, um, and who they're fighting, because now they're fighting Muslims, right? right? Um, which is different from your case studies where it was, you know, fight, fighting um, Jews that were coming in, or, or people, that were, Jews that were forming Israel, or Soviets and um, and you know, also, communists. also, also Muslims, because the the, right. the Afghan government was seen because of, it was a communist government or communist by, by ideology. It seemed like you know, uh, um, a legitimate enemy, or legitimate to fight against them. So, so Afghanistan was definitely not only against the Soviets. Actually, the Mujahideen effort started long before, not long, but a few years before the, the Soviet invasion. The United States, Pakistan, and, and, and Saudi Arabia, which created some kind of a triangle of, uh, of uh, alliance to support the Mujahideen, uh, came after they had been already in the process of fighting against the uh, uh, communist government. Uh, and only when this pressure became unbearable for the government, they actually called the Soviets to, to help them. So they invaded. And it was, it was then when Brzezinski, uh, then uh, um, national security advisor to the president, said, um, uh, well, he said it much later, but he he, 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 he made it uh, like, he said, we wanted to give the Soviets their, their own Vietnam, something like that. So, uh, so but, but it, was, it was later, the, the Mujahideen started. But, but also when you mentioned um, social economic status and poverty, yeah. it was you know, saying that there were some people that were educated, it's just that their status, and I think today we see, might be educated or might be, um, you know, second generation living in Europe mm -hmm. or someplace else where um, they come from a class, but they don't see their opportunities or their ability to fit in. You know, so it might not be that they're poverty or, you know, they're on the street or, you know, something. You know, they see they don't really have an opportunity or they don't see themselves fitting in more on the social and the social economic. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great, you know, the study looking at the evolution of this from the perspective of ideology, the state, other actors inside of states for today is a great, um, would be a great thing for, for others to also take up and look at. Are there other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Kitty and I'm just uh, finishing up here at the security studies program. I'm writing my thesis on foreign fighters mm -hmm. and also uh, my PhD as a whole. Um, my question is, uh, my question concerns um, success and what impact foreign uh, fighters have on uh, success. And I know that David uh, uh, David um, Mellet says that uh, if there's um, foreign uh, fighters involved in a transnational conflict, then uh, they were m uh, more successful than if uh, they hadn't had foreign fighters. So I'm wondering if that's something that you've come across as well in your to um, conflicts that you researched, and then also what you project uh, to happen in um, Syria, whether foreign fighters do actually um, contribute to more success or not? Well, you know, for comparison, we don't have enough cases that we know, you know, uh, well enough about them to, to make conclusions. But let me uh, say this. Um, 
1948, the uh, volunteers uh, were not only a disaster as they are um, portrayed by Arab historiography, especially Palestinian histor historiography, because um, you won't find one good word said about these people who came to fight for them by Palestinian historian or uh, politician. From their viewpoint, they were a disaster. Why? Because they created expectations, and at the moment of uh, 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 the crucial moment, they tended to simply defect and leave. Um, I think in the case of Bosnia, um, volunteers were very um, destructive in the sense that they, uh, in many cases, uh, interrupted and prevented uh, possible understandings and, and, and agreements by the local uh, Muslims and their rivals uh, because they had other interests and other sort of considerations. Um, in the case of, um, in the, case of um, uh, the Afghan, the Afghan uh, uh, Arabs, it, it's, a, it's a really um, um, a puzzle to what extent they uh, were helpful at all. Uh, when you read um, certain things uh, by um, Afghans, in one of the memoirs, one, one, one of the Arab uh, volunteers coming from Egypt uh, tells the story of how when they first met with uh, Afghan Mujahideen, uh, they were asked, why do you come here? We don't even need you. Um, and and he, he, he says a key, a key sentence that I, I use a lot, uh, he says, well, um, sometimes men need jihad just as jihad needs men, which means um, it doesn't matter whether you need us or not. We needed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so this is another explanation or another interesting aspect of uh, the need of, of, of people to... Um, express themselves or to amplify their own contribution uh, within a greater context of uh, uh, Muslim or Islamic Islamic Jihad. So um, I think the, the uh, um, exception is those volunteers who came to help the Jewish uh, effort in Palestine during 1948, mainly because they were not allowed to get organized as a unit or as a as a, a, a formation, but they were distributed among various units and could actually be helpful in advising and, and, and giving uh, um, some of their experience um, rather than becoming uh, a, a particular force uh, with, with its own decisions and its own, its own uh, priorities. So that, that clearly shows how important institutions and uh, a centralized authority that could control and um, shape the efforts of volunteers and in the absence of such an agency or such a, an institution uh, much of this effort can be can go astray or or be even even destructive uh, I think yeah, we're up first and then here um, so I'm interested to know uh, whether you think that this ideological motivation is necessarily linked to violence, or rather um, this sense of like jihad promoting a, a struggle for survival almost, um, as opposed to maybe a more positive association of state building or something similar to that nature. I hope I understood your question. Yeah, maybe restate your question just to say it's having a, yeah, what's the... So, so this, this motivation that, uh, that you're mentioning that's, that's drawing volunteer fighters, like uh, maybe through this, this idea of jihad, which is kind of, um, we, like the, the, the dual association of jihad needs men to mm -hmm. fight for the cause and men, uh, men need jihad for belonging. But that's kind of linked um, to, you know, in a sense, violence because they're, they're, they're foreign fighters, they're volunteer fighters, they're, um, they're fighting for the cause and sacrificing themselves. But is there, are there, so like, what are the implications for perhaps non-violent non movements in that respect, in terms of that ideological motivation? 
nonviolent. In nonviolent state building, non like trying like political organizations are trying to build a state, and you know that are yeah, sure. right. Is that what you might just? Never heard about. Never thought about it. Um, I mean, I mean, there is a case in forty eight of you know the Jewish you know, trying to build the state of Israel, and then the role uh, of you know they're coming in that were you know, more aggressive and fighting. I, I, I really doubt that any of those who came to uh, Palestine to fight on the side of the Jews had uh, this idea that uh, they were building the Jewish state. They simply came to help um, kin uh, um, brothers or uh, people who, who they, they, they felt close to. Um, and there were many non-Jews there also. Uh, who came out of uh, I don't know adventure, uh, adventurous motivation, or or simply uh, because they thought that this was uh, more just uh, to to help rather than not. Um, you know, it's very difficult. One of the problems here is that we don't have a um, field uh, research asking each of those volunteers why they came. The only thing that I could do with regard to the Afghan case is to collect stories from um, jihad, jihadist uh, uh, periodicals and papers, but even there, you can, you can hardly count on what they tell, because of course they would want to say that they came uh, to uh, um, help because of uh, you know, those lofty ideas, which of course uh, every Muslim is expected to identify with. Um, but, um, how about, the, how about the, I was going to ask you in the case when you're doing the uh, six years on the intelligence desk where you're interacting with the people that came in to, pal to help the Palestinians? Was there you know, any differences between people that are involved in you know, violent movements or conflict where you know, they, they saw a difference between coming in from outside to help build the state versus coming in from the outside to help fight for the state? You know, people don't think that far. Building a state, uh, these are Western notions, Western terms that do not necessarily uh, bother uh, people at that level. Uh, they came to fight because they were taught or told um, that this was part of the liberation of Palestine. Many of them came from refugee families. And um, as such, it was more than natural for them to identify with this kind of uh, uh, action, violent action. Um, but I, I, I admit that there is, there is a problem in, in trying to generalize and, and, and trying to say, uh, yeah, many came because of this reason and many others, or most of others came from other reasons. It's uh, um, the clear uh, conclusion from uh, all the studies that I've read about, for example, suicide bombers in Israel, Israel-Palestine case, um, in the last 20 years, that uh, you can hardly create a profile that is a uh, dominant one uh, of who is the suicide bomber. They can be educated, they can be uneducated, they can be uh, poor, they can be sometimes well-to-do. Um, and we simply don't know enough about what was going on in their minds, uh, how they perceived themselves within a given society or within their, their uh, uh, own uh, uh, community or those people who, with whom they had, they had to live. Um, you know, um, it, I mean, one can, can, can ascribe to uh, these, uh, these people's motivation, all kinds of, uh, of, of things that may not necessarily be the, be the most important or, or even important enough to, to push them to that, to that action. Um, and, and there is something here that we, 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 we have, we have uh, uh, missed so far. And this is the, the power of the person who is supposed to persuade people to do it. Because many of these guys uh, may be a little bit disoriented, uh, and they need direction, they need guidance. And when you have a strong um, figure 
it can be a preacher, it can be can be a a, a, a father figure model. Um, they can be very powerful in 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 bringing these people in. If if you have a if you have a, a chance, you have to see the the movie, uh, the Yakubian house. Oh no, sorry, the Yakubian building. It's an Egyptian film based on a novel with the, the same name, and it tells the story of a young Egyptian uh, um, person, the son of uh, the cleaner of a very fancy uh, uh, building, who wants to be a policeman. And he is dreaming about being a policeman. And then, after he is rejected, he becomes an Islamist, and he finds in himself eventually in prison raped by the uh, interrogator, and then he joins a militant Islamic group and comes back as a, as a, as a, uh, a fighter of one of the uh, Egyptian Islamic uh, uh, militant groups, and he, he, he gets, gets killed. So the story of how a person can move from wanting to be part of the um, system into taking an entirely different, entirely opposite uh, direction can be, you know, very, very short. Um, and, and I know, I mean, of course, I'm telling you a story about the film, but I think it represents a lot because uh, uh, from everything I learned, you know, for example, I did a, a, a research study, a field, st field, field study uh, on those people who uh, were members of the Ba'ath Party in the West Bank during the Jordanian uh, period. And I used documents, intelligence documents, captured by Israel in 1967, together with interviews. And I interviewed about 36 people of them uh, and found something very interesting. Most of them came from middle, lower middle class, um, non-refugees. Uh, refugees were busy with other things, existential issues. Um, and they were mostly urban. Um, and they had access to people who convinced them, who, who taught them, who gave them uh, uh, some picture of the world in which they, they, they were living. So out of this, they joined. Um, so we have, we have actually, I mean, one of, the, one of the questions of why people would do that, um, I'm sure you know, or many of you know about the, uh, the article published by uh, Thomas Heghammer in uh, uh, APSR, uh, to stay or to go. So, like those vacillations of, of youngsters who stand in the face of uh, this uh, war in Syria and asking themselves, should I stay, should I go? Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it's very much uh, um, about the, the, the personal individual. Of course, we would love to know or to have some some profile or some, some uh, uh, general uh, guidelines that would tell us who is more prone to such uh, uh, a, a move. But I, I think we are, still, we are still trying to find our ways in, in this context. Uh, hi, my name is Elizabeth Hamlin. I'm a first year student in the program. And you spoke to uh, the more punitive reactions from governments in Egypt when these fighters returned. And I was wondering if you saw any examples of rehabilitation or reintegration for these fighters or these volunteers and what that looked like and, and how any state involvement, if any, was involved? The exception is Yemen, okay. which um, when the war in Afghanistan came to an end, um, they more or less came to some agreement with the volunteers that they would be uh, uh, accepted back mm -hmm. if they were um, to promise not to be involved in, in any such activities. Um, so in the case of Yemen, many indeed returned home. I don't know about any rehabilitation uh, process. I know that in the last few years there are some of such programs in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, um, 
but I don't know about those returnees of, uh, of the Afghan war. Remember that it was all new. This was the first uh, major experience that Arab governments uh, uh, confronted with, and uh, they were not really uh, prepared to, to uh, or, or didn't know what to do with those, with those people. Um, because many of them were formerly uh, part of uh, militant opposition groups, um, the, the, the Egyptians, just like the Saudi Arabians, um, knew how to uh, prevent them or to arrest them or to interrogate them, but not, not, not much more, more than that. I remember that in 2005, a Saudi um, official, which remained anonymous, uh, said, we learned the uh, lesson of Afghanistan, namely about Iraq. But actually, if you look at the list of casualties or of, of uh, uh, dead uh, uh, people in, in Iraq during the 2004-2007, uh, you'll find that mm, the, the highest number is of Saudi uh, volunteers who got killed. <laughs> so um, to what extent they really learned the lesson in the sense that they, and, and even if they learn the lesson, the question is, to what extent the, the, the Saudi state, as it is, and, and what we know about the Saudi state, weak, uh, very uh, uh, spread over a tremendous territory with long borders, with uh, especially northern neighbors, what Saudi Arabia could really do especially when every year you have millions of people coming for pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage, <coughs> coming and going, it, it turns the state into a very penetrable, very um, weak to, to, to become sealed or, or to be able to prevent the return of, of, uh, of volunteers. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's a, another characteristic of, of the weak state or the the weakness of the state and its ability to deal with those uh, those uh, cases. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Do you want to ask a question in the middle? Uh -huh. well, one thing. We're talking here about Islamic volunteers, but in 1948, how many of them were Islamic? It seems to me they were more national. The Islamic emphasis came later, even through the 1960s, for example the head of the PFLP, another organization, was a Christian. It wasn't Islamic at all. It seems to me the focus of the identity and the commitment has changed over time for a variety of reasons. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, you are talking a lot about the past. You are absolutely correct that, um, if I may generalize, uh, Arab nationalism gave way to Islamism sometime in the 70s, 80s. That's clear. However, when you look at the documents of the um, 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 Army of Deliverance, as they call themselves, in Arabic, it's Jashin uh, al and you see the names of the battalions, and you also follow the publications, the announcements, they try to be uh, sound as much as Muslim as they could. Uh, in Qad, just like the word, it's, it's actually more um, accurate to translate it into salvation. And in Arabic, there is salvation too. But these are very Islamic terminologies. And the word jihad and mujahidun and mujahid for the singular were used endlessly in the documents. So even if many of them, absolutely, actually the majority came from ultra-nationalist movements and, and parties from Iraq, from, from Syria, or from um, non-Islamist uh, minorities, like the Alawites, the Druze, the Circassians, um, they were using a, an Islamic language which um, gave gave the flavor of the need to connect to something that was meaningful to the rank and file, the, 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 the ordinary people. Besides, there were some 2,500 to 3,000 Islamic 
volunteers who were simply members of the Muslim Brotherhood coming from as far as Tunisia, Libya, Sudan, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, um, and, and, and who simply followed the order of the supreme um, guide of the, of the movement to go and fight in Palestine. And they were a different case because they were not paid and they were not organized by the Arab League. Here we can see a true expression of societal, uh, uh, say, emotional or uh, uh, religious uh, tendencies rather than <coughs> an established institutionalized uh, project as the other forces of 1948. Um, uh, okay. My name's Pat. I'm a uh, second semester student here. I was just wondering how much do you think that this uh, indirect support is effect of lengthening time horizons for building legitimacy? For example, like when the more centralized, more stable of these governments as they get older, if they're able to build more legitimacy, do you expect this phenomena to uh, slowly die off, or do you think it's too ingrained, kind of culturally in the region, to really dissipate? Yeah, this is a good a good question. Um, I think, by and large, we are talking about short term, uh, um, sort of um, um, success of the state to reap the benefits of supporting such, such uh, uh, projects. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the literature, foreign policies of um, most of the developing countries, and, and I'm more familiar, especially familiar with the Middle Eastern countries, um, they tend to be very short-sighted uh, in, 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 and focus on very temporary issues in order to survive from today till tomorrow. I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, but that, that's the, the idea. Um, so uh, this is one of, one of them. This is another instrument. It doesn't mean that uh, they don't uh, um, have any, anything in, in return from this. On the contrary, in the case of Sadat, for example, look, he, in 1979, he signed a peace agreement with Israel. Uh, between this uh, uh, event and his assassination in 81, he did everything he could to announce and to publicize his support for the Mujahideen, the Afghan Mujahideen, uh, uh, including hosting uh, with uh, a lot of fanfare um, leading uh, figures of the, of the Islamic uh, uh, Jihad in, in, in Afghanistan, uh, providing them with weapons and, and uh, with uh, facilities to propagate their, their uh, Jihad and, and, and so on and so forth. In the case of Saudi Arabia, it's more, more complex. But remember, in 79, they had the attack on the uh, uh, Kaaba, the, the uh, Haram Sharif in, in, in Mecca. Uh, and for two weeks, they, <laughs> this whole compound, this most sacred place for Islam in the world, was actually captured by revolutionaries, jihadists. So, so for the state of Saudi Arabia to get rid of as many as possible of those potential supporters of such movements was a matter of, uh, I mean, even without propagating it too much. But, you know, it's very simple. In 2003, I'm sorry, 2013, I heard in one of the Arab uh, um, um, radio stations in my home in Jerusalem, a preacher from a mosque in, in, in Jeddah calling people to go and fight this infidel called Assad. So whether Saudi Arabia as a state was for or against, again, this call of the preacher meant that um, I guess he wouldn't have done that had he known that uh, he might be punished. I mean, he could, but that's my assumption. Um, so, so I think basically the state is not expecting long-term reward or, or benefit. It's simply in order to pass or to cross the, the strait of, of that specific time until another opportunity would, would uh, emerge. So 
uh, I don't think we have to, we have to expect to to see you know uh, these uh, changes uh, um, or uh, we should not be surprised to see these changes uh, taking place. I have a two-part question. Uh, I'm interested, and this might be related to what Patrick asked and Elizabeth. Uh, I'm interested in what primarily, and I know there's a host of factors, motivates the governments to renegade later on the returning fighters and arrest them. And whether it's fear of incoming fighters and building networks that are connected to the group they were fighting with through indoctrination, whether it's the government fear of having people who might pose certain danger to the, uh, to, to, to the society because fighting became their trade. Uh, and second part would be whether the effectiveness or number of arrests somehow correlates to how much control a state exerts over the population, whether stronger states, let's say, are more efficient at it, or weaker states are just frantically trying to uh, do something. So if, if you have any insight on that for your research and work. Hmm. So as I mentioned, many of these volunteers from Egypt, from, from Saudi Arabia, were actually um, more or less activists in Islamic social movements. Many of them came from the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, when Sadat allowed, already in 81, a few of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, members to go to, to Afghanistan as doctors, simply to treat the, um, the Mujahideen, he warned them not to be involved in any uh, uh, active uh, uh, combat, because he didn't want to see them coming back with the more experience. What happened there is something entirely different. But it was clear that many of the members of the two major um, terrorist uh, groups, Islamist uh, militant, um, the Gamal al Islamiyah and um, the Egyptian Jihad, uh, were allowed to go. Now, imagine you are the um, um, representative of the security, the domestic security organization and you think to yourself, OK, these guys are going there. They, are, they will be fighting. They will be connecting with others, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. What's going to happen when they come back? And indeed, the 90s, the 90s were the worst in, the, uh, in terms of the uh, level of, uh, of uh, uh, confrontation between the government and uh, uh, Islamists of these two, mainly two, these two groups. And, and, and it was no question that the impact of the returnees, despite the uh, preventive uh, uh, attempts of the government, um, was, was quite clear. I mean, the, 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 and, and the same thing can be said about Algeria. The uh, uh, GIA uh, there was not the only one, but this was a group that had its roots back in Afghanistan. And many of its uh, uh, leading members were actually uh, returnees or veterans of the Afghan of the Afghan war. Um, in Algeria, the, the the government was much less active in combating these groups because of the uh, mental difference between the uh, ruling party, the FLN, and the military, um, and distance from society. I'm sure you know that during the the 90s um, massacres uh, took place took took place uh, in various towns and, and villages, sometimes neighborhoods within the capital, at a distance of really nothing, a few miles, sometimes hundreds of of of, uh, of meters. Excuse my my international measurement. Uh, um, without the army taking any, any action, simply because who cared? The money of gas and oil came to the public coffers anyway and could be, um, or could or enable to pay the military and the, and the uh, apparatuses um, without any care about, about society. I mean, if you really look into it, you will, you will see a very interesting picture about state-society relationship, namely almost a total disconnection 
between the two. And, and I, I hope I'm, I'm understood when I say state and what it means versus, versus society. Um, so, I'm not sure I answered your question, your first question at least. What, what was the second part? Uh, I was also interested whether it was more or less prevalent uh, between the states or the, let's say, government institutions that exerted more control over the population rather than the ones who had less hmm. uh, control, who were more of a, not to say failed state, but um, somewhere in between. I can imagine that certain government apparatuses can be way more established and the security sure. services might be sure. way more effective and present within a society and some other ones less mm -hmm. in which uh, people would have would feel more freedom to follow their things that they want to do and, 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 and ideology would be easier for groups to actually foment dissent and create opposition to the state. I think in the case of Egypt you can sim definitely say that uh, this is a strong or relatively strong state. Um, and the way they treated the returnees was more efficient than others. Saudi Arabia, um, you could see that the, the returnees managed to um, not only uh, implement a number of, uh, of attacks, but actually, um, and pres probably due to the, uh, to the Gulf War and the presence of Western, Western uh, um, um, military, military units uh, on, the, on the soil of, uh, of uh, if not Saudi Arabia, at least the Gulf uh, uh, area, um, made, made a tremendous um, resentment or created a tremendous resentment, not only by bin Laden, whose story might be to some extent representative of what happened to many Saudis, namely uh, an, a, a tremendous anger at the um, royal, royal family due to the invitation of, of the Americans to come and, and fight against, against Saddam Hussein. Um, and, and this went on for a number of, a number of years. But again, uh, despite the clear de division between Egypt and Saudi Arabia as uh, strong versus quite weak state, um, both of them suffered from uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, Islamist militant attacks. Um, and in both countries, basically, the state managed, and I, I want to finish with this statement because it's very important. In both, or in almost all the cases, whether we are talking about Tunisia, Libya, Sudan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, even Yemen, to a large extent, during the 1990s, managed to um, keep the Islamic movements under control, if not to uh, um, repress them, so badly that in Algeria and Egypt, the militant groups um, announced a unilateral armistice or, or ceasefire in 2000. Um, something that the governments of Algeria and Egypt refused to accept, but it, it only meant that during this whole period, despite the rise of Al-Qaeda, all along the 1990s, Islamic militant groups uh, were mainly seeking national targets rather than international. And the whole idea about global jihad was not yet uh, fully ripe, even though already by the late 90s, as we know, it, it, it had, had clear, clear uh, um, um, manifestations. But it was due to this success of the governments, in my view, that what is called Al-Qaeda uh, made a turn or a shift in its priorities from domestic not that, that they canceled or abolished this option, but they basically turned their priorities from the, the domestic to the, to the international, simply because the international arena was much more permeable and was much, much easier to penetrate or to, to, to uh, 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 operate there. 
Um, and I think it still is to a large extent. So that's a good, excellent place to end. Um, so uh, I guess uh, you are here on campus. Um, yes. So if there's an you know, additional follow-up or you had uh, something, um, you know, go ahead and email Dr. Sella and probably has office hours. If there's something we didn't get to today. Um, with that, uh, you know, we're at the end. Uh, people probably need to get to class and other things. Well, thank Dr. Sella for joining us today.